Welcome to Hope 2020. Thank you so much for joining us from all over the world. Hope 2020 would have not happened without the support and the love from the volunteers, our amazing speakers, and the most important, you, our attendees. Thank you so much. Social influence, manipulation, are attacker's motive and have been traditionally used in psychological operations like social engineering. On similar thoughts, our first talk for the day is Hacking a Human Mind in Conversation by Josh Patrick. He is a clinical counselor with British Columbia Association in Canada. He combines his vast experience with mental health with advanced practical mind body knowledge to teach how a human mind works and how it can be exploited. So let's have Josh on the stage now. from New Westminster, British Columbia, Canada. Tonight we have an extra special presentation. We'll be talking about how to hack a human mind in conversation. And this is done by penetrating the conscious mind's critical factor. And we do this to elicit a desired response from our target. This is an advanced psychological presentation that will detail how the Homo sapiens sapiens mind's conscious critical factor operates. Now this factor governs the responsiveness to any demands made upon that human. And it regulates whether that human will comply or not comply to those demands. And the factor is inherent inside the human's conscious mind and it's gating this responsiveness in order to protect the person's security or their family's security or their organization's security. But hacking a human mind in conversation really means understanding how this unique human's critical factor operates and how it gates these commands and whether it will respond favorably to how you want them to respond or whether they don't respond. Now this process is of course employed in social engineering. When we're trying to get someone to do something, they may not want to respond. So we might obfuscate our identity or our intent. Alternatively, we can rely upon understanding how the psychology of this critical factor operates in order to formulate our suggestions upon this person so that they'll respond with the highest success. So penetrating a human mind means bypassing suggestions through the conscious mind, through this critical factor, and delivering these suggestions to the subconscious mind where it gives us a type of root access. When you can deliver your suggestions directly to someone's subconscious mind, they will respond a lot higher frequency. So within the human consciousness, we have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. The conscious mind are things that you have direct present awareness on. And this allows us to be able to not have to think about everything all at once. The conscious mind of, includes uh, awareness of our sensory perceptions, intuition, and our cognitive mind. Our cognitive mind is the active thought processes, the imagery in our mind or the mental narrative, the voice inside of our mind. The subconscious mind, compared to the conscious mind, contains many more processes and it has access to a lot more retrievable information from our memories, from our, from our surroundings, our sensory info, and from, and from extra sensory perceptions. The conscious mind fades into the subconscious, meaning that we have areas that we're highly focused upon and then other areas that fade into background awareness. 
So what's called the limen is the supposed border that divides the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. When we say something is subliminal, it means that it's below the conscious mind's awareness, but that the subconscious mind is aware of it. So as demands are made upon a human, the critical factor analyzes how these demands are being made upon the human and whether that they should respond or not. By adjusting our communication to allow these suggestions to pass through the critical factor, we'll have a lot more success of our demands upon this person. So consciousness has a focused locus, that's the area or the point of awareness, and sometimes we have multiple areas that we're focused on. Another area that will come into play is the fight, flight, freeze response. This is the autonomic nervous system's response when an organism is under a lot of stress that they perceive as potentially threatening or dangerous. This response helps us to fight back or to run away. However, it also can cause emotional uh, uh, emotional reactions. So sometimes uh, if we want to, uh, so sometimes the fight, flight, freeze response creates emotional reactions and this reactivity can sometimes also be helpful. So the difficulty level of achieving a desired elicited response from a human is determined by how aligned your will is to that human's will. Of course, if this is a, something that that human doesn't want to do, the difficulty level gets higher, but it just requires more use of the techniques that we'll be talking about. So when you're hacking a human's mind in a conversation, we can either hack their mind by force that is, using threats or fear or intense stimulation to try to break their will and get them to, uh, get them to break their will knowingly. Alternatively, we can just formulate our suggestions so that they bypass the conscious mind's critical factor. And in this way, we can control someone's uh, elicited response by entraining their conscious mind. And so there's definite benefits to using consciousness entrainments over control by force. When you use control by force, you'll be affecting that human afterwards. If we use consciousness entrainment, they may never know what hit them. So when we choose a human to target, we want to choose a human that we will likely have higher success in getting our desired response. A desired response might be a behavior that they do, some sort of action. It might be for them to adopt a certain belief or thinking pattern, or it might be for them to feel a certain emotion or have a certain reaction in a certain situation. We want to choose a certain human with a likelihood of either following through with a behavior, a thought, or an emotion. And we can actually choose a human specifically to target each of these types of responses. So there's three phases when we want to choose a human to hack their mind. First, we want to target a human and produce a psychological profile of how their critical factor in their conscious mind operates. Then we want to modify our communication patterns in order to communicate with this person's conscious mind to bypass our suggestions into their subconscious mind. Then we want to entrain their consciousness to a certain level of consciousness depth. That's the state of either arousal or relaxation and we want to strengthen our relationship to them or create a relationship of friction based on what type of desired response we want out of that human. 
So the first phase is targeting a human. We want to select a human for their ability and susceptibility for the suggestions we're going to give them. So humans form groups normally and we can look at what type of a group or what we call a morpha they're in by their phenotypical presentation. Oftentimes people will naturally divide into subcultures or organizations or cliques and by looking at the group that they're operating in we can start to see what type of role that they see as potentially their purpose. By understanding a human's purpose, we can see what direction their will is taking them and what level of targeting and hacking will be necessary in order to elicit our desired response. So a human morpha is a species phenotypical variety that happens within a shared environment for example, you might have hackers and they dress all in black and they're able to work with technology and computers and they might have a different set of purposes, but it's within a set of uh, defined roles. For example, white hat or gray hat or black hat. Another human typical morpha is, for example, a Democrat or a Republican. You can start to see their political views coming through the groups they operate in and also their belief systems and feelings. So identifying a human's morpha can help us see their will or their, and their purpose. So by understanding that purpose, we can start to modify how much degree of consciousness entrainment is necessary in order to elicit our desired response. So through your lifespan, your brain develops differently based on the different activities that you participate in. If you're a very visual person and you like to watch movies, then the visual circuits in your brain will be highly developed. If you like music and you're a very auditory person, the nervous system will develop to focus upon hearing. If you're a very spatial or physically oriented person, the nervous system develops and it focuses more on movement and action. If you're a very emotionally focused person, the nervous system develops and so you're aware more of emotions with inside yourself or other people. These nervous system developments are what we call assets. They're channels where the volume to the conscious brain is a lot higher. For example, if someone was a film student, any visual cues sent to their brain will be paid more attention to than, for example, potentially emotional cues. So when we approach a human, we want to see what channels their nervous system is listening to and we want to start focusing on how to send our suggestions through those channels. People often relate to the world based on how developed certain assets are. For example, a visually focused person might say, do you see what I'm saying? Whereas an auditory person might say, do you hear what I'm saying? And so forth. So if we use the language of the channels that that person has developed, those suggestions will be more powerful upon them. So humans use communication boundaries in order to keep some distance between ourselves and other people and other events and action. So if you are someone who feels physically vulnerable, you may use your emotional boundaries to keep the world at bay. Whereas if you're emotionally vulnerable, you may use physical elements to keep people away. The same is true if you feel mentally vulnerable, you may use your physical body or your emotional boundaries to keep distance. What this means is that sometimes people feel that their emotions are vulnerable, so they'll draw more attention towards their body. And if someone tries to elicit attention towards their emotions, 
they'll divert back to their body and to direct physical action. Whereas if someone feels physically vulnerable, they'll be drawing attention away from their body and away from physical actions into emotional topics or into intellectual subjects. These communication boundaries actually are operating within all conversations with people. Oftentimes, you'll have a human who is what we call physically suggestible. There's someone who likes to go out into a social setting, dress up really nicely, and have the attention on themselves and their physical form. In this way, their emotions may be vulnerable. If you give a physically suggestible person a direct command to their body, they're much more likely to respond than if you were to make a suggestion to their emotions or to their thoughts. Whereas for an emotionally suggestible person, they take inferential commands, meaning if I were to physically tell them what to do directly, they're not likely to respond. But if I were to inferentially start to drop suggestions, they'll start to put the pieces together and then they'll respond to that. So in phase two of hacking a human's mind, we take the psychological profile that we've made of their human morpha, the groups that they're in, which identifies their purpose. We also take their suggestibility typing which defines whether they'll respond to direct commands to the body or whether we have to formulate commands inferentially for their emotions. And then we look at what neurological assets are defined, whether they're a visual person or an auditory person or they're a spatial person, and we formulate our communications on these channels that are highly defined. In phase two, we're going to be adapting our communications using this psychological profile in order to allow the demands we make upon this person to increase in the response that we want to get. So communications are adapted to exploit the conscious critical factor vulnerabilities inherent in this target. So when we're communicating with our target, we want to mirror their purpose focus on their assets channels, and use suggestibility typing. So when we communicate with a target, we want to mirror that target's purpose, focus on their asset channels, and use suggestibility typing. That's modifying our language to bypass their critical factor based on whether they're emotionally focused or physically focused in terms of responsiveness. And we want to figure out where that person is in terms of their personal narrative, what's going on generally for themselves in their life. So our communications should mirror a target's purpose and focus on those asset channels that are developed for them. We should also use suggestibility typing. That's the type of language that their critical factor will allow to access the subconscious mind. We also want to identify their own personal narrative, their place in life, and their tone. That's their mood and their outlook on life. So animals naturally will mirror the behaviors, thoughts, and feelings of those that are surrounding them, their peers. So people that they feel secure around, the human will naturally start to mirror them. They'll start to behave the same, adapt similar mannerisms, they'll start to think in certain similar thought patterns and adapt similar beliefs and worldviews, and they may feel emotionally similar feelings to those people around them. By mirroring a target, we increase the allowance of the critical factor to respond to the suggestions we make upon them. So we can mirror their mood, the type of language they use, the tone of language, and the quality of communication. And this entrains the conscious mind, meaning that it will open up and follow the directions that we're giving the target. 
the subconscious mind is naturally picking up on this mirroring and it allows more suggestions to pass through the critical factor when it's being mirrored. So consciously in this process, an attacker can take this mirroring lead and give directions. The amount of suggestibility will increase to a perceived authority figure. Meaning, if someone's seen to have figured it out in their thoughts or their behaviors, we're likely to follow their lead. So the type of suggestibility, or the suggestibility kinds that we want to use, refer to how we formulate our language of the suggestions we're making. Dr. John Kappas, a, a hypnotist, uh, wrote detailed descriptions on physical suggestibility versus emotional suggestibility. Physically, suggestibil physically suggestible people take direct directions to their behaviors. So you can tell if someone is physically suggestible if they enjoy awareness or attention placed on their actions or their body. And these types of people will respond more to direct commands like dance with me, or do the dishes. Compared to physically suggestible people, emotionally suggestible people do not respond well to direct suggestions because they don't appreciate that attention on their body. Instead, their mind allows suggestions that are made inferentially, such as, it would be so much fun if you were dancing with me. The subconscious mind is picking up what I'm saying that I want them to dance with me, but their emotions are gating this request, so I'm not allowed to make it directly. A, subset, a subsection of intellectual suggestibility. That means they won't follow your suggestions or demands made upon them unless they have an intellectual reason to believe them. So communicating to our target, we want to identify whether they're suggestible to direct commands, whether they're physically suggestible, or whether they're suggestible to indirect commands, inferential suggestions, that's emotional suggestible people. And there's different subsets within this based on how comfortable someone feels uh, in a certain behavior or belief system or certain emotional feeling. People will avoid certain topics or actions or feelings based on past negative experiences. But just look at what behaviors and thoughts and feelings that they will present to you and mirror those back to them. So within the Star Wars documentaries, we saw a good example of direct suggestibility. That's making direct commands. Force persuasion was the ability of the Jedi's to make direct commands, give insinuating body language, and use their psychokinetic influence to get desired results. So we want to adapt our communications to a target's personal narrative. If that person's mood is very low, we want to match and mirror that mood. If they're someone who's very peppy and they have a high mood, they're someone who's really effervescent and happy, we want to mirror that too. Because the critical factor allows suggestions made by someone who that they perceive is like them in the same personal place in life or the same personal tone of consciousness. So if somebody is very depressed and you make very happy suggestions to them, the critical factor will totally disregard those suggestions. So humans naturally follow a personal narrative. That means how they relate to the world in terms of what they're trying to accomplish and their position in this. So if someone feels like a victim, we want to use that victim language and mirror it back to them. So empathetically reflecting a target's personal place using elements from their own narrative will allow our suggestions to bypass this critical factor and go directly to the subconscious mind. So when someone feels that they're familiar with you, their behaviors, thoughts, and actions become less guarded. They're those re uh, responses 
that uh, are more casual, they feel like they have a more range of personal expression, whereas if they feel like you're a stranger or that the attention upon them is critical of them, then they'll revert to more rehearsed behaviors. Those are the sort of automatic responses of a person. So by matching the tone of language of the target's mood, we will definitely increase the suggestibility. Great, so we've chosen a target. We've made a psychological profile of them. And based on what type of elicited response we want, we choose a human who is likely to respond. So if we want someone to do an action, a behavior, we will be choosing a physically suggestible person and making direct commands. Whereas if we want someone to believe a certain belief or adapt a certain thought pattern, then we'll choose someone who's emotionally suggestible. Once we've adapted our communications, in order to bypass them through the conscious mind's critical factor, they're delivered to the subconscious mind where we have a higher rate of desired response. The third phase of our communication is to entrain their consciousness. This is the amount of relational connection that we have upon this person. And this is determined by the strength of that relationship, the quality of it, but also the depth of how relaxed or activated their nervous system is. So conscious entities will naturally entrain to the sensory inputs and actions of others around them. Meaning if you're really hyper, people will start to feel hyper around you. Whereas if you start to talk slower and calmer, that will have a calming effect on others around you. So the stronger the relational connection will allow for more responsiveness to our suggestions. So within any relationship connection in a conversation, it follows a certain stages. And these stages allow for us to connect to a person, develop this relationship, make our suggestions, and then allow for that person to have their response. If we develop the relationship in order to have a lot of quality in the relationship, but also attain the desired depth of relaxation, we'll be able to achieve a state that is significantly higher at producing the results we want. So the first step in any relationship is establishing rapport. We want to introduce ourselves, get to know the person a bit, and make them feel comfortable. As we said, if someone feels comfortable, they'll have a greater range of expressions, and so we can elicit a greater range of desired outcomes. Next, we want to identify the purpose or the goal of this conversation. What am I trying to achieve out of this human target? Then we want to give whatever behavior contextualizes our requests and obtain however much consent we can gain from a human. If someone agrees to something, even if they don't know what they're agreeing to, we have a higher likelihood that they will follow through. Next, we want to use relaxation techniques to achieve a relaxed state of consciousness where responsiveness is much higher. Alternatively, if we want to cause a reaction, cause a strong emotional response in this person, then we want to elevate the activation of their nervous system instead of relaxing them. But when someone is in a deeply relaxed state, they are way more open to receiving suggestions because the conscious mind is fading into uh, subconsciousness. The critical factor is not running as strongly. And so we can communicate more directly to the subconscious mind. Then we, after we've made our suggestions, we want to close our conversation allow that target to re-emerge to a normal state of awareness, and then to brief. So the depth of consciousness 
that we want to achieve in order to increase suggestibility is the state of deep relaxation between being awake and being asleep. When you're in an in-between state of deep relaxation, the conscious critical factor in the mind becomes relaxed and allows a lot more responsiveness. So our consciousness is always ramping up, becoming more energetic if it feels like there's a threat or if it feels like it needs to handle something, or it can become more relaxed if it feels like there's no immediate stressors upon it. Our nervous system is naturally navigating these states of awareness, or states of activation, based on the types of perceived action that it senses. So if we wanted to cause a strong emotional response, we can cause the nervous system to become activated to stressors or by agitating the critical factor with types of suggestibility that the person is unlikely to respond to. But in order to increase suggestibility, we want to achieve the in-between state of deep relaxation where the critical factor is lulled and commands are allowed to bypass it directly to the subconscious minds. So the four general states of consciousness start when you're asleep. They call that delta waves. The state of being in between sleep and awake is called deep alpha or theta waves. And it's in this in-between state that suggestibility goes way up. But in order to achieve that state, the target needs to feel secure in the conversation. So we follow the path of the stages of the relationship. So drugs have a dynamic effect on the nervous system and we wanna be aware if somebody is on any drugs that will increase or decrease the likelihood of uh, achieving a desired response out of them. For example, stimulants will increase the nervous system's activation, so they're likely to react and become more activated rather than to achieve that relaxed in-between state. Alcohol, on the other hand, is a depressant overall and will help to relax people, make them more vulnerable to suggestions but it also can create emotional reactivity and compulsivity. Cannabis might increase relaxation, euphoria, but it can also cause dissociation. Psychedelics may affect someone's perceptual awareness and they be, may become a lot more heightened to suggestions of altering someone's perceptions. It may open someone to spiritual suggestions as well. Hypnotics increase the relaxation and suggestibility, but may also reduce responsiveness. A drug called devil's breath, scopolamine or hyoscine, is a delirium. It's used as a seasickness medication or for gastrointestinal cramps but it's known to cause someone to increase in suggestions. Antidepressants may lower neurological reactivity and increase someone's mood stability, but also their psychological happiness. So let's look at some of the experiments done by the CIA in the past. They were investigating different methods of using hypnosis in conversation to identify what range of responses you could get out of a target, whether they would respond and do something outside of their normal behaviors if you were to use hypnosis. So in an interview, they asked a professional hypnotist do you think that this system would be useful in obtaining information from a recalcitrant, obstinate, and entirely uncooperative individual? 
And they said, yes, definitely. And how far do you think individuals can be controlled by hypnosis? This is a very difficult subject. Post-hypnotics will last 20 years and will be very strong if reinforced from time to time. However, if, di however, if direct control is wanted, and particularly without reinforcement, perhaps 12 hours would be the most you could expect. And even then, a possibility exists that the person under hypnosis might suddenly be awakened. The CIA was experimenting with what they called hypnotic couriers. This was putting someone into a hypnotic trance, reciting material that they were to memorize. The conscious mind was not aware of memorizing this, and this information could only be retrieved using a secret passcode and under hypnosis again. So they were using people to carry secret messages that could only be retrieved under hypnosis. So they tried a hypnotic experiment on two girls to see whether they could program them to take secret code words and be, respond with certain behaviors that is setting off what they believe to be the detonator for a bomb. And they found that the experiment was carried out perfectly without any difficulty or hesitation on the part of either of the girls. Another experiment they conducted was on one of the CIA's secretaries. They put her into a state of hypnosis and she was programmed to kill another person using a, a firearm and this particular person was very averse to firearms and they found that they could successfully get her using conversational hypnosis to fire upon someone else and later not remember doing so. So they wrote in the CIA documents, frankly I now distrust much of what is written by academic experts on hypnotism. Partly this is because many of them appear to have generalized from a very few cases partly because much of their cautious pessimism is contradicted by agency experimenters, but more particularly because I personally have witnessed behavior responses which respected experts have said are impossible to attain. So in conclusion, hacking a human mind in conversation means finding a human target analyzing their psychological profile to determine their suggestibilities. That is, what factors will allow suggestions to pass through the conscious mind's critical factor and allow compliance with either a desired behavior, emotional feeling, or thought. So specific target vulnerabilities allow the suggestions to pass through this critical factor and we are able to communicate then directly with the subconscious mind. This becomes increasingly difficult as our wills diverge, but as we saw in CIA experiments, they were able to achieve basically what they thought was previously impossible. So a target human is analyzed for their specific suggestibilities. We can look at their morpha or what group they operate in to see their purpose. We want to operate appearing in line with their purpose. We also want to communicate to those neurological assets what channels of sensory awareness have been developed in this person. Are they a visual person, a spatial person? And we also want to use suggestibility typing that's formulating our suggestions as direct or indirect, whether they are physically suggestible or emotionally suggestible. So communications are adapted to penetrate this critical factor. We use mirroring of the person's psychological factors, like their mood and language and tone, and we use those suggestibility kinds of language. 
such as direct suggestions or indirect suggestions. And we use language that matches someone's personal narrative, where they're at in life, and the tone and mood that they're in. So the strength of our relationship in the conversation will allow for a greater uh, eliciting of desired responses. By achieving a relaxed state of consciousness, known as the theta wave states, that's the state between being awake and being asleep, people become very more suggestible to commands. So by training a human using the stages of conversation into a deeply relaxed state, we will greatly enhance our ability to elicit a desired response. Whereas if we want to cause an emotional reaction or reactivity or volatility in this human, then we want to activate their nervous system by irritating the critical factor with suggestions they're not likely to respond to. Also, we've learned that drugs will affect a state of consciousness, of course. So to learn more about me, you can see my website, joshhealthcare.com or counselor.app, vika.studio or ibdmentalhealth.com. So our backdrop was painted by Janine Dunn, who's done our video production. You can check her out on Instagram. That is the end. I can sense the force is strong in you. Study it and become a force master. Good luck and Godspeed. Hi, Josh. Thank you so much for joining us today and for an amazing presentation that you recorded for us. Thank you. We have a few questions and from our audience, and let me ask you one by one. The first question is, what's the background that you have? I mean, from where did you get it? What's the artwork? Hi, Josh. Thank you so much for joining us today and for an amazing presentation that you recorded for us. Thank you. We have a few questions. Okay, I'm ready. So you're asking about the background artwork. That was a mural done by Janine Dunn. And you can look at her website. I believe it's forlab.design. The painting was done to show a crowd of people gathered around. Obviously right now we're doing social distancing, but the topic was about uh, looking at humans in conversation and obviously we can't gather in a big group right now so that uh this is just uh something that uh, well all of our groups have changed totally fair enough thank you uh the next question is how do, you, how do we identify what are our critical factors? Yeah, and a lot of the details were in the presentation and I provided the link to the slides and you can look more closely at the details. The critical factor is basically the part of the conscious mind that guards our responses to uh, outside uh, requests made upon us. So to identify your own critical factor, 
you want to look at yourself. One of the key things is if you're a physically suggestible person versus an emotionally suggestible person. Physically suggestible people, they say it's around 10% of the population, but there are people who like to have uh, attention from these big crowds upon them and upon their physical bodies. And so people who dress up really nicely and who have a lot of uh, things in their outfit to draw attention to their physical bodies, they are going to be a lot more physically suggestible, which means they're going to take direct commands. Uh, so you can see in like the Star Wars movies, they're using all direct commands to the uh, people they're trying to use per force persuasion with. Uh, like, you don't need to look at these droids or whatever he says. That's a really direct command. So only people who are physically suggestible would respond to a command like that. Whereas the opposite of physical suggestible is called emotionally suggestible. These people take only commands inferentially. Uh, so you have to do a lot more basically explaining, breaking things down. Basically, the mind is using uh, emotional details like a barrier between responding to what you want. So you have to basically allow their subconscious mind to assemble the command from within all of the uh, details that you're giving to a person. Basically, you start to inferentially just say how nice it would be for you to do the thing that you want you, them to do. And the subconscious mind sort of picks up the pieces and will put them together. It's quite common that people are a balance between being emotionally suggestible or physically suggestible, either taking direct commands or indirect commands. And you can look at yourself in any relationship relationship to another person or a group and just see uh, yourself how you are responding to certain suggestions or behaviors made in the group or by a group leader to start seeing what your sort of critical factors are in terms of suggestibility. Uh, and another thing I talked about was neurological assets, meaning if you're uh, raised typing on a keyboard, you're a lot more likely to take a suggestion to type a command, for example. Whereas people uh, who have never used a keyboard before, it's going to be a lot more difficult to get them to use a keyboard. That's a simple example, but um, yeah, so we see in a big group of people, one simple command will have success uh, only in uh, very specific uh, uh, people within the group. All right, Josh, we have one last question because we are running out of time. Do you think anything like MK Ultra could ever happen again? or is it happening under a different name? Oh, uh, the MKUltra projects, we're discovering the basic science principles of the security of the mind. And they used uh, hypnosis. Like we went through examples to show like what was possible using conversational hacking and what sort of behavior outcomes you could get and they used chemical drugs and they uh, used electroshock and uh, other sorts of combinations of technologies. Once they had discovered the basic principles of the security of the mind, uh, some people have suggested that these technologies were maybe used by outside agencies or groups uh, such as the mythical Project Monarch to create uh, 
basically live agents. I won't uh, speculate if that's real or not, but it's definitely possible with the technology. And like the quote that uh, CIA were laughing about uh, is that most of what you hear is what is theoretically possible from people in psychology is not true. Like you can do much more than what they say is possible. And uh, yeah, you have to imagine that if you can be doing this, that they might be doing it. And for the security of our nations, if it is possible, you would hope that we are doing it to protect uh, our nations, but being done in a way that doesn't turn people's brains into scrambled eggs. And that's finding that uh, right balance. <laughs> I suppose, and this isn't an ethical talk, but the possibility is there. And most people do not believe at all what is possible because their view of the mind is very simplistic. Uh, basically, they don't incorporate the subconscious mind, which what I was explaining in the talk is if you can gain access to this subconscious, you can basically own their minds, uh, sort of responsiveness. All right. Thank you so much, Josh, for sharing your learnings and knowledge to all of us. So yeah, thank you again. Uh, for the attendees, stay tuned. We would be back for the next talk, which is at eight in one hour. No, 10 minutes from now. So yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Josh. Thanks.